Welcome everybody uh, to this live stream on regenerative economics. My name is Kees Klomp and I'm your moderator of uh, today. Uh, and this program is a co-production, co-creation of Pakhuis de Zwijger and Circle, uh, a platform for the acceleration of the shift towards a circular economy. And uh, today's talk will be uh, in English because we have an international uh, guest in our midst, uh, John Fullerton, who I will introduce uh, to you shortly. Um, and uh, you're very welcome to participate uh, from home. And if you want to do this, you can do this by uh, choosing the chat function of the Q&A. And you can leave your questions or remark in that and we will take care of it uh, in, the, uh, in the program. We will um, uh, ask the questions uh, to, to John uh, or uh, my other guests. Uh, and today uh, we are going to discuss, uh, well, basically the fundamentals, the fundaments of our society and the financial system um, and, and how we can work together to transform the economic system or the eco um, or the societal uh, system as a whole uh, in a way that is both uh, fair and future proof, which are, of course, uh, essentials uh, nowadays. Um, and we are very honored to introduce to you our guests of today. We have three uh, guests. And first of all, uh, on my left, uh, the uh, Marleen Janssen Groesbeek, uh, Professor uh, Sustainable um, Finance and Accounting at Avans uh, Hogeschool of the Avans University of Applied Science. Uh, and next to that is Hein Brekelmans. Uh, Hein, you are Head Sustainable Finance Desk at ABN AMRO. Uh, thank you for being in our midst. And uh, our uh, keynote speaker of today, uh, all the way from the US, uh, Mr. John Fullerton, uh, uh, with us uh, via, via live stream. Uh, John Fullerton is uh, the, the founder of Capital Institute, uh, a regenerative uh, economist, impact investor, uh, and in my humble opinion, one of the uh, thought leaders worldwide in the um, domain of new economics and new finance. Uh, John. Would you be uh, so kind to share your talk with us? And we will get back after that to uh, answer questions and discuss a couple of topics based upon your talk. But the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Keys, and great to be with everyone. Um, I'm talking to you from Eastern Connecticut, the place I moved to during the pandemic, and I um, can't be with you, with you all in person. Um, but I must say this um, this this non-flying COVID model is um, is is pretty useful uh, for these kind of situations. Um, I'm going to take you all on a on a short journey that I've been uh, re that really has been my struggle for the last 15 years, uh, trying to reconcile this idea that our economy is predicated on exponential growth and yet we live on a finite planet. And uh, that's really the crux of the matter. And the more one wrestles with it, and I think increasingly we're waking up to this now, um, mostly around climate, but the issues extend well beyond climate from uh, all kinds of other ecological issues, as well as the social crises that are facing us, social and health crises that are facing us, and, and the result in political crises. So, um, the, the, the pressure is rising, and um, this is my, I've, I've been blessed and with the, the opportunity and cursed with the burden to feel that, that this is my, my purpose, is uh, to use the 20 years I spent uh, at J.P. Morgan, so, you know, a deep grounding in what finance and economics, uh, how it works, but then the freedom to really try to reimagine something fundamentally quite differently because I don't I don't think we can incrementally get to where we need to go by uh, tweaking the system. So um, my, sl my slides are working. Um, you know, I, I've concluded that we are trapped in an old story in, you know, grounded in a theory, uh, which, as I said, is, is largely simple to be simplified. Uh, prosperity comes from economic growth. And um, we're trapped in that theory more than we realize. And this has happened before in human history. Uh, the Ptolemic worldview that the Earth was the center of the universe and the sun rotated around the Earth held our, um, you know, thousands of years. And um, we tried to fiddle with 
our understanding of astronomy and made tweaks and modifications to try to moved around the earth. Um, but ultimately, uh, Copernicus came along and, and looked at things in an entirely new way. And if, if ever one needs uh, evidence that that's necessary in economics, you only need to look to the 2018 Nobel Prize Award, which was given to uh, William Nordhaus uh, for his work on, on climate change models. And uh, believe it or not, that model calculated that the optimal target to uh, shoot for as a global society was three and a half degrees warming. Uh, the idea being that anything more restrictive on economic growth would cost too much. And uh, the model is filled with, um, quite frankly, trivial uh, mistakes. Like, for example, if manufacturing happens indoors, it'll be less affected by climate than agriculture, which happens outdoors. So uh, the fact that the peak of, of economics could award its uh, most prestigious prize for a model that said we should all buckle up and target three and a half degrees warming is to me proof of, of really the, the bankruptcy of, of, um, uh, of, of classical economics. Now let me switch and, and talk for a second about complexity and what happens when complex systems um, uh, are under pressure. And I would argue that our human economy is a complex system and obviously the biosphere, the ecology, the, the ecosystem that, we, that our economy is embedded in is a complex system. Uh, and take a simple example of a pot of water on the stove. Um, uh, it's, it's in liquid form, they're all bunched up in the middle. And if you apply pressure, um, uh, gradually turns to steam. And that's what complexity science calls a phase shift transition. And I think we can imagine human society uh, at the brink of a phase shift transition as well as we apply the pressure of exponential growth of both population, but most importantly, material throughput, the metabolism of the human economy is uh, in, you know, increasing exponentially year after year, notwithstanding setbacks caused by events like the financial crisis and more recently COVID. And we're now at this critical uh, tipping point, really, where we either fundamentally transform the system uh, or we will continue uh, and enter into this collapse phase. And some would argue uh, we're already in this collapse phase. And the outcome, once we get through that phase shift transition, is unknowable and unquantifiable. And, um, and so this is, very serious. this is a very serious moment we find ourselves at. Um, and uh, I, would, I would go so far as to say that we're, uh, we're entering a new era as profound as the shift from the medieval time to the modern era. And the modern era brought us all kinds of progress uh, and the, scient the, the scientific revolution led to all kinds of advances in our human society. But at the basis of the reductionist method of calculating and analyzing what's complicated. And we're going to need to shift from just using a uh, reductionist methodology to understand uh, the holistic nature of reality. And it turns out that um, our economics and finance were built on a foundation of classical physics. Um, take one simple example. We still run our monetary policy as if there's a simple cause and effect between raising interest rates and economic growth. Oh, dear. You want to have this toggle between rates and growth to manage inflation. Um, but that's a highly simplified version of how the economy really works. And of course, there's lots of uncertainty. So what the economic profession has done is shifted over to to manage the risk, the standard deviation, the uncertainty around uh, our, our, our models that are built on outdated physics. And of course, the problem with that is that statistics assume disconnected causes, like when you roll a dice, the next roll has nothing to do with the last roll. But in reality, the real world 
is what, what the scientists call organized complexity, with everything interconnected with everything. And that leads to patterns um, uh, that, that are exquisite, really. Um, but these patterns are not random. They, they evolve, they emerge out of uh, the complexity. And, um, and we need to reimagine our economy in this, uh, with this understanding of, of patterns and principles as opposed to uh, a reductionist approach to managing uh, what is ultimately not manageable because it's complex. We can manage what's complicated, like a cell phone or an iPhone is complicated. We know how to manage the production of that. But anything that's complex, whether it's uh, our own family, uh, our own bodies, uh, or the entire human economy, um, uh, needs to be managed with an entirely different approach, in my opinion. And that's what this idea of regenerative economics is really about. Um, I wrote about this in 2015. The paper's on our website at capitalinstitute.org. Um, and I focus on economics and finance, but this holistic way of seeing the world really is transforming every domain of knowledge. Agriculture being the most obvious one, regenerative agriculture is now a well-established idea. Um, but you're seeing it transform uh, really every domain of knowledge, and if it hasn't yet, I predict that it will. Um, so a quick definition and, and, and an assumption, really, um, uh, to keep in mind. What I'm proposing is that the human economy is a living system. And it needs to be understood as and, and behave as a living system. And if it's meant to be sustainable over the long run, it will need to operate in accordance with the same patterns and principles of all other living systems that have stood the test of time. Now, if you want to debate whether the human economy is a living system and whether it therefore needs to follow the patterns and principles of, uh, of other living systems, that's fine. But I would, uh, I would challenge you to explain how a human economy that is made up of humans, which are clearly complex living systems, and operates within the context of the biosphere, which is also a complex and, uh, according to Gaia theory, even living system itself. Certainly it behaves in a self-organizing way of other living systems. How is it possible that the human economy could violate the, the rules, the patterns, the principles that explain other living systems that have not collapsed? So that's the premise of regenerative economics. Um, it follows a, a long line of um, tweaks or, or, or fixes, just like the Ptolemic astronomers uh, were trying to explain. Um, neoclassical economics, as I mentioned, is built on a foundation of, of Newtonian physics. Um, uh, it makes all kinds of assumptions that are demonstrably inaccurate. Um, there's plenty of good intelligence in economics, plenty of good tools and, uh, and methodologies that we need to keep, but we need to recognize that the foundation of classical economics uh, is really built on a, um, uh, an outdated understanding of physics, which is not, does not explain our economies. Environmental economics, the idea where we internalize externalities, is a critical um, uh, advance. But it doesn't solve the problem because at some point we have to recognize there's a difference between a cost that can be fixed with money and a wrong that can never be fixed. The breakthrough of ecological economics and Herman, Herman Daly's work is, is really truly profound because it for the first time introduced the idea of finite scale to a human economy. Believe it or not, macroeconomics, if you, if you read a macroeconomics textbook, you won't find the word scale. Uh, or you won't see any reference to limits or, or boundaries in a macroeconomics textbook. The macroeconomy is simply assumed to be the sum of all the microeconomies, from households to firms, government entities, et cetera. And the, and the promise, the, the, the difficulty with an ecological economics framework is that you're sort of forced into this um, very sober reality that we need to shrink. The John, do you hear me? You, yeah. you, you, have a, you have a bit of a microphone problem, and I think um, if, you, if you could remain a bit uh, oh, still. I might, be, I might be interfering with it. I yeah, just, ju just a bit. And uh, the, yeah, the production is, uh, is tweaking it uh, if I would like to share it with you. So if you could st sit a bit still. Then, no, still. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I apologize. I have to click my clicker, though. Yeah, so yeah, I know, I know, I know. Just, yeah, just so you know. Good, thank you. So. Um, uh, the, the, the promise of regenerative economics is that 
living systems are profoundly uh, emergent and filled with potential that we don't see yet. And so the idea here is that by shifting to a living systems paradigm, a regenerative paradigm, we will unlock potential, which will become the source of our future prosperity. And we will be no longer dependent on exponential growth, which has reached its, its, its limits. And that, that potential will be realized in the form of uh, social capital, as well as uh, preserving our, our ecological capital. Um, uh, one nice way to, to see the distinction between regenerative and sustainability is a chart that my colleague Bill Reed developed. He focuses on the built environment, so I've simply applied it to the human economy. And, and the idea here is that in order for a system to be sustainable, we need to move from the left where we are today towards sustainability, doing our incremental improvements. That's all critical. But to truly reach sustain, a sustainable state, we need to adopt this regenerative process, the outcome of which is a sustainable system. So our bodies, for example, are regenerating as we're sitting here on this con in this conversation. And the outcome is that our bodies are sustainable. So the key is to understand the regenerative process and apply it to uh, our economics and finance. And for me, the critical way to begin that journey is to get clear on first principles. Um, and I've developed a, a simplified um, way to describe living systems principles applied to economics and finance. Uh, there are eight principles, ideas like uh, in right relationship, uh, views wealth holistically. So money is not wealth. Uh, a lot of the integrated value reporting is highly aligned with that. Uh, innovative, adoptive and responsive. Obviously, innovation is going to be key for us. Uh, and many innovations have yet to be realized, and, and I'm confident will come. Uh, empowered participation is the idea that a healthy system needs all participants of the system empowered to participate in the health of the system, or the system as a whole will not be healthy. And I can go on each of these, but, but I won't today, given uh, our time. But one thing we in finance need to recognize is that uh, we are fundamentally um, the root cause of a lot of our challenges because of our pursuit of economic efficiency. We see finance as the, the sort of sitting on the top of the economy allocating capital, which then decides how resources, natural and human resources, are used from the planet. When in fact a holistic understanding of living systems would have us see that finance actually needs to be embedded in and in service of an economy, and the economy is in fact embedded in the biosphere. Uh, and that's a fundamentally different view of, of things. Another um, uh, area where we in finance are particularly, um, uh, you know, foolish really, is this principle of balance. Balance applies from everything from balancing feminine energy and masculine energy uh, to this idea of balancing efficiency and resiliency. This comes from uh, actual studies of living systems, and it turns out that um, that systems that sustain themselves uh, balance the resiliency and efficiency. And in fact, the window of health and vitality is skewed toward resiliency. So no wonder when we have a financial system that's optimizing the efficient return on capital uh, and the pursuit of, of, um, of, of financial returns at the expense of the, the system health, we have a financial crisis. Same with the pandemic today. The supply chains are all, have been designed in, you know, with just-in-time inventories. And so We've got all kinds of uh, lack of resilience in the supply chain that's causing, uh, that's wreaking havoc. So an understanding of living systems will give us a new design for how we should um, see our economy. Now, I've tried to apply this to the financial system with a second paper. Um, it's also on our website. And um, I'll just give you a couple of quick glimpses of, of what's in there. Um, you know, a lot of the uh, sustainable investment activities that we're familiar with uh, can be nicely laid on this same um, uh, spread from degenerative to regenerative. And um, clearly the, the shift into green bonds and impact investment is to me the flip into a much more regenerative way or, or, or the, at least has the potential to unlock regenerative potential. Um, I think you know, one of the challenges in our financial system is that um, we, we disconnect with place because of the global uh, financial flows. And so reconnecting to place is happening in, in a concept called uh, place-based integrated capital. 
And the ideas on the right, uh, you can read about them in the book, they really don't exist yet, but I think it's where we're heading. Um, what, what, we, what we do, though, is we, we manage most of the money on this planet in accordance with a theory. Remember, theory determines what we're able to see, which is called um, uh, modern portfolio theory. But unfortunately, modern portfolio theory is, again, based on this flawed statistics. It's, it's essentially a theory of, of speculation. And the risk associated, the risk that we measure is, is portfolio volatility, not the real risks in the real economy that affect our lives. Um, so there's a, there's a, you know, for those of you that are young, aspiring uh, economists and financiers, there, there's a need to develop an entire new theoretical framework for the investment uh, of, of capital. Now, in my own investment practice, I've tried to do this in this very simplified model. Um, I think of risk and return as a constraint rather than an objective function. Liquidity is also a constraint. And then I seek to um, invest my own assets in such a way that are responsible, that's resilient, meaning they generate cash flows um, that, are, that will ride out economic cycles and the difficulties that I see coming, uh, and that optimize regenerative potential. And if we had more time, I could give you the examples of those. But most of my portfolio is either in actively managed uh, activities like that or in things that are at worst uh, neutral. So I, I know this is possible. Now, there are many companies that are um, beginning to wake up to this regenerative paradigm, which is fantastic news, uh, Walmart being one of them. And so the challenge is how do we implement this inside a big global corporation? Not an easy question uh, by any means. Now, most of the um, sustainability work, I would argue, is, is uh, or I, I believe, is focused on products and services. So if you're in the oil and gas business, you're kind of out of luck. Uh, if you're in renewable energy, you're, you know, have potential to be a regenerative company, and we report on all that and, and measure our carbon footprints and measure our social impacts, et cetera. Um, but I believe the, the key to uh, implementing the regenerative paradigm actually begins at the opposite end. It begins with getting clear on first principles. What is it that describes how living systems actually work? Uh, and there's lots of nuance in those eight principles. Um, they happen to be highly aligned with indigenous wisdom. So um, there's something, uh, you know, essentially remembering what we've already forgotten. And then beginning with culture, um, in particular organizational health, how organizations behave, moving to governance, uh, capital structure matters a lot. The relationship um, of companies with their investors is often uh, overlooked. We have, we have a situation today where in global capital markets, um, investors don't really have a relationship with, um, with the companies they invest in because most investment is, is reduced to either passive indexing or speculation. And then of course, business models matter. And then finally, products and services. Um, a quick word on metrics. You know, I, I, I know um, AMRO, our host, is, um, has actually, is that really at the forefront of, of reporting on their impact metrics, which I applaud. Um, I, I tend to feel that there's a danger in our getting too down the rabbit hole on metrics and missing the big picture. So I've not spent a lot of time on metrics. Some of the other, uh, my other colleagues on the panel are going to be more uh, articulate on, the, on them than I am. Um, but obviously metrics are important. Uh, measures of regenerative health have yet to be developed. They're quite different than outcomes met metrics. They're more intrinsic measures of health, and we haven't yet developed them for a human economy. So we're, this is a work in progress uh, for sure. Um, if you think about technology companies, um, you know, many of them have very regenerative products. Um, I would argue that Google, you know, Cisco certainly provided the infrastructure for the internet. Uh, the internet is inherently regenerative. It distributes knowledge and empowers participation around the world. Google had an opportunity to be um, probably the most regenerative company in history, but it applied a business model, which is the extractive advertising model that, that uh, damaged that opportunity. Um, can banking be regenerative? Absolutely. Banking is about circulating uh, finance. And, and robust circulation is one of our principles. Um, so, uh, and banks are filled with uh, deep relationships with their customers. So um, uh, there's certainly opportunities for banks uh, to behave in a regenerative way. And of course, the Global Alliance for Banking on Values is demonstrating how that can be done 
focused on the real economy as opposed to focus on financial speculation. Um, it's interesting if you compare the uh, the Global Alliance on Banking's values, uh, their principles with the eight living systems principles, you'll see a lot of overlap. Not entirely, but you'll see a lot of overlap. So I think there's a, a pathway there for any, any large bank. Um, now, what about this recent phenomenon, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency? Uh, I'm no expert on this, but, um, uh, but I will say uh, the following. I think the, um, uh, oops, sorry about that. I think the, um, you know, the, the problem that, that cryptocurrency is looking to solve is quite different than the one I'm interested in. And so if you think about traditional finance, uh, now being um, uh, revolutionized, really, and I don't think we can deny that this crypto movement is here to stay. I I think a lot of this is just speculation. But you know, remember when the internet just started, uh, most of it was pornography, and and of course the internet is far more profound than uh, than pr pornography. And speculation really is the pornography of of um, of cryptocurrency, in my opinion. But the possibilities of the blockchain and, and, uh, and other techno related technologies to implement a regenerative economy, I do believe are profound. And we're studying that now and actually going to include that in a course we're uh, developing. So I think any bank, any financial institution uh, has an opportunity with this uh, decentralized blockchain and alternative currencies using uh, token, the tokenized economy and cryptocurrency to actually implement uh, incentives for the uh, move toward a regenerative economy is, is, um, is quite profound. And I'll close just by quoting uh, one of my teachers, Bucky Fuller. He wrote a book called Grunch right before he passed away. And it startled me to read this relatively recently where at the end, in a sense, his message to humanity was that nature is a totally efficient self-regenerating system if we discover the laws that govern that system and live synergistically within them, sustainability will follow. Again, sustainability is the outcome of the regenerative process and humankind will be a success. And so that is the, uh, those, are, those are the words that I follow and, and uh, have committed this work to. And thanks all for, um, for participating today. Thank you, John. What, a, what, a, what an uplifting um, message there. The, the, the book, Mr. Fall, is uh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, before we go into uh, a couple of questions that got through uh, via um, our uh, Q&A, I, I would like to invite um, uh, our other guests to, to ma maybe reflect a bit upon uh, John's, uh, John's talk. What, would, you, would you care to uh, reflect, Marlene? Yeah, if we, uh, if we remember one of the first slides, then uh, John gave the constraints, uh, risk and return, and the other one I forgot. But, um, um, uh, but if you look at risk at, at, and return uh, at the moment, then it's not a constraint, it's still a goal. Uh, so... If we want to move really to a regenerative uh, economy and, uh, and the financial sector has to play a very important role in that, yeah. then, um, then we have to let go of uh, risk and return as a goal yeah. and, uh, and, and see it as a constraint. Hmm. Sounds like quite a big step. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> a major leap. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, if a professor in sustainable finance says, uh, uh, says it's a big step for, for me as a banker, is of course it's a big step for us, uh, the financial institution, financial industry, it's a very big step. I found it a fascinating story and I think uh, we need to go there, but still a long way to go uh, for the financial industry. Uh, and I think, I keep on thinking in what way can we um, hold on to the shareholder system if we... Uh, if we want to make that big step, is that possible or should we um, uh, leave that, uh, that, that, that system? I think we should leave that system because otherwise it will not going to uh, work. Yeah, that's a good, well, well, John, would you like to reflect on that? Yeah, so, um, you know, the shareholder system we have today is broken. Um, there are plenty of private companies that are managed differently. 
Um, but in our pursuit for efficiency and lots of well-meaning and, you know, believe me, I, you know, I, I, I'm a capital markets professional, right? So I'm, I'm guilty. Um, but we, in the pursuit of efficiency of capital, we've, we've prioritized liquidity and trading of securities at the expense of the real relationship between investors and enterprise. And so if, if, if you, you know, to make a, a simple example, if you have a private company, then the, there is a, there, there's often a name on the door, but there's also a relationship which, it, which it embeds in that company the responsibility that goes with ownership. And if you, if you break that um, chain of ownership and have either passive index funds or short-term term speculators, you know, owning shares and then behaving as if they were the owners when they're really not the owners, they're just short-term rent seekers, um, the current system can't work. <laughs> so one of the things that, um, that I think is critical is for companies to rebuild relationships with owners that truly uh, want to be responsible for those companies. And those are the companies that can, tr can transform much faster. And just on, on Marlene's point, I'm glad you picked up on that. I, I obviously had to go through a lot of material quickly, but this flip from risk, adjust, risk return being the goal to a constraint is actually, um, I think, really, really essential. And if you're Bill Gates, your constraint is very different than if you're a pensioner. Yeah. And, uh, and to be a responsible investor, you're, you need to adjust your constraints, uh, your risk return profile accordingly. Uh, and that can be toggled. Um, you know, some investors, you know, if you're a pension fund, you should be delighted to have very resilient cash flows generating five, six percent uh, returns. And we can structure companies that have mature cash generating businesses to deliver that kind of a, a return to those type of investors. But it's essentially making the capital structure more complex and matching business businesses and business models to investor needs in a way that doesn't mean that um, uh, generating high returns for high risk um, innovative projects is, is, uh, is not possible. It's absolutely possible. Yeah. I'll give you an example. I've just discovered that algae is being used in agriculture uh, in a new way that is truly profound. Um, uh, saves water, sequesters carbon, eliminates input needs, and no one's ever experimented with algae in agriculture before. And I believe this company will be enormously profitable and generate enormous returns while generating systemic value um, that is nowhere in anyone's projections on climate change and water scarcity today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. that sounds, it's also a hopeful sign. Can I, can, oh, yeah. I, can I pick up on the pension fund and the shareholder system? By all means, yes. Because um, what we forget, especially in the Netherlands, is that we are all shareholders. Mm -hmm. So, because in the Netherlands we have this uh, capital uh, pension system where we all save a, a big amount of mm -hmm. money uh, every month uh, to, put, to put in our pension. So, all the Dutch people who have an, a job, uh, uh, also at uh, ABN AMRO, we have, we have a pension fund, so we are shareholders. And there is a definitely... Uh, a disconnect between what the pension uh, beneficiaries want from their pension fund and what the pension fund is doing with their investment. For example, my pension fund is investing in fossil uh, fuel industries. They are still in coal, they're still in shell, and I'm very angry about it. But I don't have a say, I can't switch from pension fund, so we as a shareholder in Shell, um, um, I want to leave. I want to sell my shares of Shell, but I can't because my pension fund mm. uh, doesn't want to sell uh, shares uh, of Shell. Yeah. So we're very stuck wicked. in the system. Yeah, very wicked. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. Mm. Um, well, speaking about um, um, wickedness or challenges, how, how would you... Um, what do you think of the Dutch situation from a regenerative economic perspective? Where, where are we? Uh, if we, if we just heard, heard John's talk, and um, what do you think? Are we, are we well underway? 
<laughs> no. <laughs> that's, a, that's almost a rhetorical question. Oh, well. no. no, we aren't. Uh, we no. definitely aren't. Uh, if you look at the different banks in the Netherlands, then you see small projects yeah. that are focused on uh, regenerativeness. And, and if you see the steps that John already described from impact to more regenerative uh, investments, then, then we are in this transition phase, but by a long shot, we're no. not there yet. But are, 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 what do you think in, um, for, for the Netherlands? Are we, are we behind in, on, on the general uh, scope of things, or are we moderate? From this perspective, I, I, uh, to be honest, I, uh, it's not a thing I, I gladly say. But uh, from a f uh, the financial sector in the Netherlands, is far ahead of uh, the financial sector in other countries. Yeah. So yeah. whilst we're still are very on a very very moderate level from a regenerative economic perspective, yeah. we are front runners in the Netherlands. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hein. How, is it, how, how are you looking at from a perspective from ABN? Where are you at the regenerative economics? Well, I'm, I'm a, proud, a proud employee of ABN yeah. because I'm sitting here and, uh, in, in circle and we are discussing this topic. Yeah. But I'm, as a person, I'm a little bit pessimistic because I, I, I agree with your point of view. I'm a little bit pessimistic that we are far ahead and we are still have such a long way to go yeah. to, to reach that uh, regenerative economic uh, end goal. Yeah. Yeah, so. but, but, but do you think it's a matter of evolution and evolvement, or do you think it needs a disruption or a, a, a leap, as we were just discussing risk return well, versus uh, constraint? Uh, I, I, I hoped we needed a, a disruption, and we saw a disruption, and have we learned yeah. anything from the disruption? Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah. But I think we, we, we see a lot of intrinsic motivation also with, uh, from colleagues within ABN AMRO. We see a, a purpose-driven, we, we are not there yet, we're not, no. there, not, not even close. And now you see from Europe, you see all the legislation coming as well. Yeah. So I think that helps and I hope that the companies who are having a, um, a competition advantage right now, they create a level playing field for those companies. Yeah. So I'm a little bit optimistic from yeah. that point of view, but still... Uh, uh, very long way to go. Well, and listening to Marleen, we also we we have to take our role then because if, if we are front runners in this in the Netherlands from a financial perspective, then we we, we need to lead the way. And so, John, how, how is that? Uh, how is that in the in the U.S. the the, the regenerative finance situation? <laughs> he nods his head. You know, well, uh, the, the the Dutch banking system. You know, I don't know it well, but, um, you know, first of all, it was the birthplace of Triodos Bank, which is, yeah. um, you know, certainly um, probably the, the closest to a regenerative bank that I'm aware of. And, um, you know, we can debate the scale and whatnot. But, um, you know, one of the problems with the global banking system is that everyone pursued these massive aggregations of scale, um, uh, which is in conflict with the fractal structure of um, of living systems. So, yeah. an AMRO that's focused on um, on the Netherlands and and uh, and Northern Europe actually fits quite nicely into the way uh, a living system would organize its circulatory system. And um, uh, you know, I I think no, there's no question that the speculative, you know, Wild West finance capitalism center of the universe is is the United States and um, uh, we're not going to lead this unfortunately no. well hey uh, what I would like to do now is to introduce uh, a couple of, of issues topics uh, and we will discuss amongst each other uh, the questions or the, uh, the the issues you so you can reflect on these uh, these issues and these issues have been um, uh, uh, brought to us by uh, via the Q and A, uh, and so um, uh, you can um, you can elaborate on your opinion on these uh, issues. And I think I hope now we're going to see the ah, there it is. Oh. So so the first uh, topic, and we have five minutes to uh, to uh, to discuss it uh, amongst uh, each other. Is uh, the topic the first topic is uh, real change comes from intrinsic motivation, not from external pressure like uh, a true pricing mechanism or European taxonomy. Um, uh, so 
um, what, what is your perspective on change? Does it come from the inside out, or do we need uh, law, laws and legislation to make things happen? As the most dominant <laughs> form, because as I the most dominant yeah form. yeah because we need both. I I totally understand, <laughs> but <laughs> I'm I'm all in favor for laws and legislation. Laws and legislation. Yes, we we come in the Netherlands. We come from the model of intrinsic motivation yeah. and pressure from stakeholders. Uh, uh, we have this great guy in the Netherlands who, who is called Herman Weifels, and he was the, the, the father of uh, corporate sustainability yes. uh, in the Netherlands. And he always said that uh, because of the reputation me mechanism and the pressure from the stakeholders, companies will change. Well, uh, I'm almost 30 years in sustainability now, Didn't happen, eh? and I'm, I'm still disappointed. <laughs> so for me, <coughs> laws, yeah. legislation, yeah. Pressure yeah. works very well. All the way. <laughs> Hein. Yeah, <clears throat> I agree. Within this system, we need laws, uh, law and regulations. But it's we are working right now also on uh, EU taxonomy, on uh, all kinds of uh, legislation that is coming from Europe. And it's quite a pity that we need, in some instances, 50 pages to write something down. Yeah. Corporations, you should not do this, this, and this. And if you just... Close your eyes, feel for three seconds. You, you think, okay, this is not good. Don't do this. Yeah. So this, this is also a little bit, uh, for me, it's a little bit weird to say that as a banker, but it's also the bankruptcy of the of the whole system that yeah. we all need because we have now we we are working with hundreds of people within the bank on all these legislations, and everybody knows what's the good thing to do, mm -hmm. but we we need a lot of. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's a pity, but, yeah, uh, yeah, but, but, we, but, but at the moment, go, coming from the old system, moving forward to the new system, yeah. we need this, uh, call it purgatory, where we, where we get chastised all yeah, the time that we're yeah. not sustainable enough yeah. or not regenerative yeah. Uh, enough. Yeah. Yeah, not, also probably because of the time pressure, of course, because there's little, little time to make big changes. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. John, yeah. What, what, what is your view on this? I, I mean, I, I agree with um, what's been said. I, I, I guess I'm a both and person. Um, and no doubt we need some big, powerful sticks. And I totally agree with uh, Heinz's comment about the, the process of regulation, particularly in finance. It's just absurdly complex and filled with both, you know, political um, pressure and, and manipulation and then, you know, excess complexity and cost and and yet we brought it on ourselves because we we don't do the right thing so we're we're sort of eating our we're eating our um what we've we're, we're reaping what we've sown yeah and um that may be part of the painful process we need to go through yeah. um I, I i would make one other comment i think i think the change really is going to come from places we don't see it uh, as much as what we think we can manage. So I'm hopeful from that point of view because the, the more the pressure rises, the more things will change. And so, yes, we need the rules and yes, we need the reporting, but um, complex systems shift when the pressure forces them to shift. And, yeah. and in, in, you know, the, the good news and the bad news is the pressure's rising. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a very nice bridge to our to our second uh, topic, uh, uh, and it is, that is that we more and more, of course, uh, come to the uh, inevitable conclusion that we need a real proper breakthrough, and that we can't go on and continue in the um, in the in the current um, in, the, in our current system and our current way of um, of dealing, both from an economical and a financial uh, perspective. Uh, and then, of course, the question is, uh, how do we create <laughs> such a breakthrough? Is it, is, what, what's, your, what's your take on it? Will, John, is, John is suggesting that it might happen spontaneously, that the system will stir things up and, uh, and create a system, uh, system change. Um, what, what's, what is your take uh, on this? I, I hope that the change will come from uh, the students we work with, so the yes. generation between 18 and what's, let's say, 26, 
that that they are going to be uh, uh, because I teach in accountancy and finance and mm -hmm. control, yeah. and I do research with uh, with the, the, uh, that generation, and and and. I really, really hope that they are going to be the change agents in the financial uh, system yeah. that are going to challenge the old-fashioned thinking and also uh, are going to challenge uh, the CEOs of the companies yeah. that they work with uh, or work at. And then, um, um, and then things have to change because the, the future is theirs. Mm -hmm. We have, yeah. we have uh, the world uh, as a loan from them, so we have to be, be careful with what we are doing if we won't, uh, won't, uh, don't, don't want to ruin their mm -hmm. future. Hey, and what do you encounter in those students? Do you find them engaged and, and empowered to, to be change agents? Yeah, well, it's, it's like a normal... Um, in statistics, you have this normal uh, deviation, uh, normal uh, distribution, where you have 20% uh, that uh, is absolutely not interested, mm -hmm. and, and calling me a lefty and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, and, uh, and a tree hugger. Oh, yeah. And then you have the 60% that are a little bit interested, but don't know what to do, mm. don't know where to start. And then you have the 20%. Uh, yeah, you know them also very yes. well. They want to work with us. Yeah. They want to to work at that yeah. future. And and the hope is that we will uh, create. Uh, we will also reach that uh, sixty percent that's still doubting yeah. if we are going in the right way. Yeah, that's a good point. Hein, how is it? How how does ABN Amro help to create that breakthrough? Because I I know you have a lot of colleagues that are also really uh, pushing change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. We, we, we started a uh, ambassador network within the bank. And in 2017, we set uh, the G20, the Green 20, 20 colleagues who are uh, um, uh, allowed to work one day a week on sustainability together with our yeah. department. Those became 40, 60, now we are at 80. So we have a very big group. Um, but what we see is that um, also uh, we, we also said we have a circular ambition. So in 2017 we said 2017 we said we want to have one billion in assets on circularity. We thought that would be very easy, but we only made it to 850 million mm. because we saw a lot of small deals. And one of the big things we see is that the if you look at the circular economy, it's it's um, material extensive. We try to be material extensive, and as a result, it's labor intensive. Mm. And if we look at the taxes in Europe, 51% of all taxes comes from labor. 66% only comes from resource uh, resources and from uh, uh, natural resources and from pollution. Yeah. So if you change that then a lot of companies will start working on circularity. So you need to, if, if there's one thing that we need to change is the tax system within mm. Europe or the whole world, then change that tax system and that uh, makes companies more circular because now they are um, a, a thief of their own wallet yeah. if they start. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so basically the point that Marlene was making earlier, we need laws and legislation to for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, John, what do you think? How how do well, we I, how do we create a breakthrough? Well, first, first of all, again, I, I totally agree with what Hein just said. I mean, the tax system is is absurd, um, and and uh, you know, taxing taxing what we don't want and incentivizing what we do want is sort of a no brainer, you would think. Um, but but you know, we could spend a lifetime trying yeah. to change <laughs> tax codes, and hopefully, someone is doing that. Um, you know, to me, I've taken the bet that the biggest leverage point, this comes from uh, one of my heroes uh, who I never had an opportunity to meet, but Dana Meadows, who wrote Limits mm. to Growth, um, has a brilliant um, framework she calls Places to Intervene in a System. And um, the highest leverage point in her framework is the paradigm within which the system exists. And that's why I've chosen to focus on trying to articulate and um, and develop this narrative of a living systems framework for economics and finance. Um, because I think if we if we look through these living systems principles at things like the tax code, what we need to change becomes obvious. 
And so if we can shift people's mindsets uh, from a mechanistic mindset, a reductionistic mindset to a holistic and, and regenerative mindset, then a lot of the answers start to fall into place. So that's where I've chosen to focus my effort. Cool. Hey, we, we have a, a lot of questions also from the Q&A, and uh, although we only have a couple of minutes left, but I, I think this is a really interesting question that I want to share with all of you, so maybe we can all reflect on this as well. As well. And the question is, does regenerative economics need to lead to a decrease in financial capital, or, or isn't that not necessarily? So does, it, does regenerative mean a decrease of financial capital? Mm. Who would like to... Uh, in interesting one. It's Good question, a, it's eh? yeah. A, it's a brain cruncher. Yeah. Um, um, maybe we have to get rid of the, um, the leverage. So we, ha we now have a financial system that um, favors um, a debt and uh, and 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 and, and uh, so so not equity but debt is much more attractive and that's also the whole private equity game and uh, so I think that um, maybe not less capital because we have to invest in in loads and loads of things to make the economy more regenerative, mm -hmm. but I think we have to get rid of our. Um, um, addiction to debt. Ah, that's a good one. Yeah. John, what do you think? We have to get rid of our well, it's, addiction it's to a, debt. It's a great question. Um, you're not going to like my answer. <laughs> uh, because the answer is as troubling as the question. Um, but if you think about it at a macro level, we've got a system that's perfectly designed to convert social and natural capital into financial capital. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and more every year. And so, um, and we've got a money system that is, enables us to literally create as much capital as we have projects to, f to finance. I mean, we, we literally invent or, or, or manufacture money at will through the banking system. And the truth is that the stocks of natural capital, just to simplify it, um, are in decline. And we're dependent on them to be functional. And the human capital story is more complicated. It's our system's been very, very good for some people and horrendous for others. Um, but um, ultimately, uh, and, it, and this is the, if you, if you remember the chart I put up on the, you know, uh, across the board, way up on the far right, I had something called uh, systemic philanthropy. Yeah. It's probably not the right language for it, but I do believe we need to convert financial capital back into social and um, uh, and natural capital on a scale that few people have begun to contemplate, or the system will collapse. And uh, that can happen lots of ways. The, the financial capital will depreciate uh, uh, on its own if we keep going down the path we're on and we'll re the balance will reset through the, the, the financial capital stock shrinking or we can proactively do that and um, but on a scale that that is uh, measured in in trillions and uh, how, how to do that is beyond my, my, uh, my simple mind but um, I think we need to acknowledge that the current system design, uh, creates more capital, which then creates more of the problems that we're trying to address. Mm. And this is where I think cryptocurrency can come in, is to create money systems that create different incentives. So imagine a, a money system that incentivized, just to make it simple, regenerative agriculture. And so people would earn that, that form of token, and eventually governments that wanted to incentivize regenerative agriculture would accept that token for taxes. Now suddenly we've got a money system that is actually incentivizing what we need to happen. Yeah. Um, so you've effectively converted um, fiat currency into a, into a currency that's actually aligned with the direction we need to head. Marlene, can, uh, could I uh, ask you, because this is your, your field of, of research, um, because what John says demands our um, ability, a capacity to measure and report value in an integral way. Yeah. Also in a non-monetary way. Yeah. 
Um, so how far are we from reaching that point that we are able to, for instance, measure and report biodiversity uh, as a value on its own, rather than it being uh, monetized into money language or you know, conventional uh, financial uh, parameters again? Yeah, so we are able. So we, we could, are able already. We are able. We can, we can put the whole uh, Amazon rainforest uh, in a blockchain if we would like to do that. Yeah. And 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 uh, not and it's not necessarily uh, necessary to monetize it. So we can just acknowledge that there are so many trees, so many frogs, so many yeah. flowers in the in the Amazon. We know and the stocks and the flows. The st exactly the <laughs> yes. stocks and the flows. Yeah, yeah. Good, and, good. and 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 even from that point of view, Brazil could uh, be a very rich country. Uh, if they can can uh, have the value or not the value the the, the amount of what's in the uh, rainforest in their national accounts, yeah. But but we don't do it yet. So it's possible we can use blockchain yeah. to uh, measure uh, all our capital on the planet if we want to. So Hein, what is what is keeping us from from working with this? <laughs> So I read, because I'm, you know, I'm only a professor of applied science. I have no idea how it works in in, in practice. <laughs> it's an excellent question. I think it's it's our addiction to financial capital yeah. that that we don't want. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 the whole problem. Yeah. I think very uh, good example is what we did in Groningen. We since the 60s we've been extracting natural gas, putting natural capital into financial capital, leading to negative social capital in the end. So yeah. though that's that's. Yeah. The whole and financial capital was was exactly as on the on the on the graph of Mr. Fullerton. Uh, finance was on top of economics was on top of of, of our whole uh, society. Hey, I, I have one more question uh, uh, from the chat, which I think is a an excellent ch question to round up this first uh, part of our uh, webinar, uh, which is uh, what what can I do? This question from one of the viewers: What can I do as a financial professional? Uh, and I, I, I and I think that description suits all three of you. So <laughs> maybe you can all three answer this. But John, let me start on you. So how, what can I do as a financial professional to help the regenerative economy taking shape and um, internationally? Well, I, I mean, there's there's uh, you know there's a lot of things that that a lot of financial professionals are doing. I mean, the, you know, certainly the whole green bond impact investment, it's, it's really building on what's already happening and, um, and, and, and taking it exponentially further. Um, it, it, you know, the, these, these jobs are harder to come by. There's less of a scale there. Um, but, you know, certainly there's, there's lots of opportunities in the private investment world, venture capital world to, seek out and um, help companies um, uh, that are regenerative thrive. Um, alternatively, there's lots of opportunities to work in big companies yeah. as a finance professional to help them uh, navigate this very complex uh, transformation. And um, uh, so, I, you know, I think it's uh, limited only by one's imagination, to be honest. Cool. Hein, what is your take on this? Yeah, I would say just start the dialogue with all the people around you. Start the dialogue with your clients. Start the dialogue with your colleagues. Start talking about these these matters and don't think in too much that it's that it's too too strict. But there's a lot of there's a lot more possible also within an, an organization as ABN MO than yeah. you uh, can imagine, as long as you uh, look for the right people and yeah, well keep on the keep the dialogue yeah. going. On. Dare dare to get the dialogue going. Yes. Yeah. Good. Yes. Good. Yes. Marlene, final uh, words. Yeah, I would think that we uh, should engage people who advise consumers, uh, families about their um, mm. financial choices. So the mortgage advisor, the insurance advisor, um, those people also should incorporate uh, this regenerative thinking. Yeah. And uh, and help people to uh, to overcome their addiction to debt. So uh, live within your means, and that's also helping to uh, 
to maybe not degrowth, but helping uh, to, uh, to get growth a little bit smaller. Yeah. So also, so take it all the way to the consumer, basically. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a it's been a pleasure, John, to uh, to have you over here in uh, in, uh, in here in Amsterdam, sunny Amsterdam, uh, uh, to uh, to discuss regenerative economics. Um, and uh, I I really hope uh, you enjoyed this one. Uh, and well, I would thank also you thank you for inviting me. As always, uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Hein. Uh, thank you all for uh, for for watching. Uh, and uh, I really hope uh, you uh, you will join us on our regenerative journey uh, towards uh, a thriving, healthy world, uh, both from an um, uh, an ecological and an economical perspective. So uh, thank you very much, and uh, see you next time. Bye. <laughs>